We're so happy to have you here today. Uh, this is our Zambia town hall for DFC. And we have been doing these town halls across sub-Saharan Africa. They've been a huge success. All of the event is to allow DFC to identify new local businesses that we haven't worked with before. Now that DFC is able to work alongside local businesses, even when they don't have a U.S. partner, uh, we have a tremendous opportunity to expand across South across Sub-Saharan Africa. And we're going to be presenting for you today a presentation that is directly focused on the needs of our local businesses. Um, it will include some remarks by the charge of uh, the U.S. Charge to Zambia, Mr. David Young. It'll be an introduction from our Deputy Chief of Staff, Michelle Sarnak. I'll do a presentation, a PowerPoint presentation that, as I say, has been designed to fit your needs. There'll be an interview with uh, a current DFC client, Silver Street Capital, which I'm really excited about presenting to you because they've done a lot of the Silverlands agricultural projects in Zambia. There'll be a Q&A session and I'll be introducing the teams of people who have worked together with us in Zambia. And then we'll show you a contact slide at the end so that you can um, be aware of how to reach out to everyone. Do I have the charge yet? Is that David okay. Young? I do not yet have the charge, I don't think. So Michelle. Yeah, he's would, still trying to connect. Oh, there's David Young. Um, pardon me, Hugh, could you make him a panelist? He came in as an attendee. He's in. There. Okay. Thank you for joining us, um, Mr. Young. We, we, I would like to introduce the Chargé d'Affaires of the U.S. to Zambia. Mr. David Young, we appreciate your comments today. Great. Thank you very much, Merrill. It's nice to join you and sorry about the technical problems. Always understandable. Great. Well, hello, everyone. It's wonderful to join you today. Um, I extend a warm welcome to all the representatives of the great local and regional firms operating here in Zambia, and it's a very impressive group. Um, I recognize many of the names uh, who are longtime partners of ours, and I also see others that I don't know yet. And because of this crazy, challenging COVID year that we've been through, we uh, haven't had a chance to get out as much as uh, as we have normally, but. I want to welcome everybody to our, our virtual uh, town hall today. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, strengthening the bilateral trade and investment relationship between the United States and Zambia is a priority for us at the, at the U.S. Embassy. And we've pursued joint prosperity with our Zambian friends for 56 years now. And we're always looking for ways to expand that relationship. In uh, President Biden's uh, February 5th uh, video message to the African Union Summit, he said that the administration has a renewed commitment to Africa. And he said, we must all work together to advance our shared vision for a better future, a future of growing trade and investment that advances prosperity for all our nations. And the United States stands ready now to be your partner in solidarity, support, and mutual respect. So we believe in the nations of Africa and in the continent-wide spirit of entrepreneurship and innovation. As President Biden has said, with this vision in mind, my USAID and state colleagues at the embassy work to support the American companies that are interested in doing business in Zambia. And we also work with Zambia and their other country companies that are looking to buy quality American products. U.S. private sector-led investment brings unique benefits, including the transfer of technology and know-how, model corporate governance, local content procurement, and of course, job creation. To further foster a continent-wide spirit of entrepreneurship and innovation, the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation 
or DFC, has also opened new ways of providing access to U.S. development finance to a broader array of companies. As DFC's expanded mandate focuses on U.S. companies and quality non-U.S. investments. So we're looking for mutually beneficial private sector-led partnerships that create jobs, develop talent, and respond to Zambia's development needs. It's a win for the American people, a win for you, and a win for the Zambian people. So today, my colleagues from DFC will tell you about their products and services. I encourage you to listen and engage ask questions, and start the process of pursuing the incredible resources that DFC can contribute to our objectives here in Zambia. So thank you everyone for joining us today and Meryl, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you so much, sir. We really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. I'd like to introduce DFC's Deputy Chief of Staff, Michelle Sarnak, who's going to be talking to you about you know, why the Biden administration is interested in pursuing these objectives and about the work that we're going to be doing today. Thank you, Michelle. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and so first of all, thank you, Mr. Young, for joining us and for your remarks. And, and thank you, Marilyn and team, for, for your work to pull together today's programming. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, on behalf of the Biden Harris administration, I, I want to thank all of you for joining today's town hall. Um, we're super excited to see so many businesses interested in learning more about the Development Finance Corporation. Um, and, and we have a busy program today, and so in a few moments, you'll hear that um, you'll hear about the different types of financing tools that DFC offers to support investment and development. Um, so I'll just take a, a moment or two to frame this discussion by emphasizing DFC's deep commitment to the people of Africa. So currently, DFC has more than $8 billion invested in Africa, and Zambia you know, we support multiple projects across a range of sectors from agriculture to energy um, to financial services. And so we're hosting this town hall today because we are eager to partner with local businesses and mobilize investment in projects that will support families and communities and economic growth. And we know that Zambia has many needs for investment to expand access to electricity, to help build modern infrastructure, to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic um, and to support small businesses and shareholder farmers. And so those needs align very closely with um, the U.S. priorities. Um, and so I, I joined the DSC just three months ago, and over that time I can tell you that we've been very hard at work refining our development goals. Um, and one of our top investment priorities is women's economic empowerment. So DSC's 2X Women's Initiative is a robust program um, that invest in women-owned and women-led businesses. Uh, we also have a strong focus on health, on expanding access to health care, as, well, uh, as well as things like clean water and sanitation, um, you know, which are both essential to good health. And, and we are also a key partner in the U.S. Power Africa Initiative that's working to expand power generation, including projects that generate power uh, from renewable sources. And so finally, you know, we're, we're committed to supporting projects that will deliver benefits to the people most in need. And this strong development mandate informs everything that we do. Um, and we know that we carry out this work uh, more effectively by partnering with local businesses like you. And so your entrepreneurial spirit, your understanding of the local markets, and your in innovation are truly, truly invaluable. So today, um, you know, I'll just, I'll just kind of close here and, and recap that today you'll learn more about the ways that we can support you. Uh, we have a lot of great information to share, so I'm going to turn things back over to Merrill. Uh, and thank you again for joining today. We look forward to strengthening our partnership. Over to you, Merrill. Thank you. Just going to share our presentation. Everybody seeing that okay? So I'm going to explain a little bit about what we're going to do today. Again, this is a presentation very much focused on the needs of local businesses that will be working with us. And we're gonna start with who DFC is. We're gonna talk about how we work. We're gonna talk about what we do. But the most important thing is that we are going to be discussing how you can work with us. 
To begin, the mission of the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation, which is the U.S. US uh, development finance institution, invests with private sector partners. That's a really important aspect of what we do. We are working with private sector entities to advance economic development in emerging markets. Our goals are strong international markets based on transparent competition, rule of law, and individual freedom. You can see here that we're just one of many uh, agencies in the US government that works overseas with a goal of strengthening economic and social development. I'll just name a few. We work closely with USAID. Um, they are working a great deal on development assistance and foreign aid. Uh, and they do work on some private sector projects, including uh, through our MTU unit. State Department, of course, is responsible for US foreign policy and international relations and runs our embassies. Exim is uh, the entity that does trade financing for the export of American goods and services. And Millennium Challenge, USTDA, Commerce, Treasury are all critical partners for us and for you, uh, depending on the kind of project that you're working on. Here you can see the portfolio of DFC. You can see that right now we've got well over 29 billion in total active commitments across the world. And you'll see that for Africa, we have about $8 billion worth of investment. We intend to grow that significantly with your help. So what does DFC offer? DFC offers direct loans and guarantees to financial institutions, which will then on lend to SMEs. Uh, we can do guarantees of up to a billion dollars and tenors as long as 25 years when that is appropriate for the project. We support initiatives that have been identified also by USAID field missions. They work through our MTU or missions transaction unit. Uh, and we work on small impact loans. Those are loans under a million dollars. Loan guarantees, as I mentioned, are available to support U.S. financial, I'm sorry, local financial institutions as well as U.S. financial institutions. We can offer them as a traditional DFC product or as part of our MTU program. Political risk insurance may be a new concept to many of you, but it's been an important part of DFC's program for a very long time. Um, it is an opportunity for us to allow businesses to focus on the commercial risks of what they're doing in emerging markets while we take care of the political risk through insurance. And what we cover there is inconvertibility of currency, government interference, including passive and active expropriation, and political violence, which can include civil disturbances and terrorism. I do wanna note that we do not cover devaluation of currency. We do cover the ability to change your local currency into hard currency, and then to get your hard currency out of the country if necessary to pay uh, for services and goods. One of our newest products is equity financing. When we changed from OPIC to DFC last year, we gained the ability to do equity financing. We can do provide equity to investment funds that then invest in projects, perhaps like the ones you're doing. Uh, and we can also put direct equity into select projects. And then finally, our technical development capability, also new to us. I think this is an incredibly important aspect of our program because it allows us to look at projects that we think we may want to fund down the road and say, what would make this project more commercially viable or enhance its development impact? And then we can provide uh, funding either as grants or in a cost sharing basis to accelerate those projects and to make them more developmental. So DFC is planning to mobilize over $25 billion in the next several years. And we will expect to catalyze an additional 50 billion by the end of 2025, allowing us to reach over 30 million people. Generally, when DFC invests in its projects, it's able to capitalize, uh, to mobilize 
capital of two dollars for every dollar that we invest that's just a general average but it's a good guideline and again we're trying to mobilize private capital we also participate with other dfis in projects and ifis we expect we'll finance over 300 projects in less developed countries we're going to be deploying new technologies and expanding and diversifying our DFC client base, which is one of the reasons we're here today, right? It's to allow us to identify good, solid local business projects, and then to support you as you apply for DFC financing and insurance. In the work that we're doing, we're prioritizing low-income communities with a goal of over 60% of our projects in what we call LICs and LIMICs. Those are lower income and lower middle income projects and fragile states. Um, we're going to be creating jobs. This has been a long-term goal of first OPIC, now DFC, with a goal of 100,000 new local jobs created. Uh, it's important to note that our goal is to create jobs for local populations. We're empowering women. As Michelle noted, we have our 2X gender empowerment project, gender equity project. So our goal is to empower women and other underserved communities, perhaps rural communities that have had no access to financial services in the past. And so we're focusing on reaching 12 million women and 6 million other marginalized individuals by 2025. Introducing technology, as you know, is absolutely essential for economic development, whether it's IT and communications technology or new health technologies, new water and sanitation technologies, or energy technologies. And you're going to hear from uh, Diana Jaguna, sorry, Jaguna, uh, later in the presentation about our new uh, proposal for distributed renewable energy. So 50% of our projects, we hope, will involve innovation and technology. And as I noted, expanding DFC's client base with a goal of 15 new clients each year, with 30% of all our clients being based in developing countries. As we looked at our plans for the coming years, we looked at our impact priorities, those sectors that we think have the greatest potential to have an impact, a positive impact on your countries. And so we're going to be looking at energy, healthcare, infrastructure and technology, food security, water and sanitation, and financial inclusion. I'm not gonna go over in all the details on this here, but I will tell you that we'll be sending each of the attendees a copy of this presentation by email after the event. And so you'll have all of the details in front of you as you go forward. Important to note that although those are our priority sectors, we're willing to work in all the sectors that are important to economic development in your countries, unless it's a prohibited sector, which include things like tobacco, gambling, anything illegal in your country. To give you the quick overview, you can see that um, we've got a large portion of our portfolio in Sub-Saharan Africa, about 25% and growing. Uh, Southern Africa is about 19.3% of our portfolio at present. So this is really the meat of the presentation, right? Here's where we tell you what projects qualify to work with DFC? The first thing is you have to have a bankable project. It has to be something that could be commercially viable. Um, unlike other entities, we don't simply provide grants and then walk away. We're evaluating your project to make sure that it has the potential to achieve uh, financial returns that make it commercially viable. It can be a greenfield or a brownfield project but the project has to be able to present to us a feasibility study and a business plan that shows us how you will achieve profitability. Um, we may be pro providing um, debt or equity and we'd want to know from you what it is you're seeking. We also wanna know what level of equity is already in the project to make sure there's a commitment by the local investors parts. Uh, is there a sovereign guarantee? This is not required, but it can sometimes reduce the risk of certain infrastructure projects. 
And we like to know if there are local content requirements because we want to be sure that all businesses have a fair opportunity to provide pro uh, goods to the project or services. Then we look at impact and additionality, making sure that our financing is not replacing available financing from private sector parties. So we wanna be sure that we're additional, that we're needed, and we want to also be sure the project will create a strong development impact, as I said. To look at that, we're gonna look at what the project intends to do, who it will employ, how it will affect the local community. And we're going to address, um, you know, what other intended development impacts the, the investors have. Foreign policy alignment as a US government agency, I'm sure you can imagine, we want to be aligned with US foreign policy, working in countries that are um, operating in fair and unbiased ways in terms of their markets, and making sure that we're, we're working on projects that have relevance to national security. Political risk, as I mentioned, we do assess the political risks of the project. We're going to be looking at what the investors who are, are starting the company are planning to do to mitigate any identified risks. And we may in fact, um, in some cases, not always, but in some cases suggest some political risk coverage in addition to our financing. We do look at the investors and participants in the project to make sure that there aren't any risks of corruption or money laundering or any sanctions concerned concerns. So do be prepared for a KYC know your customer evaluation. And we certainly want to know about management capacity. What is the management's track record in this business or a similar business? Who are the shareholders in the transaction? Are we comfortable with their experience and character? And what are the financial arrangements with the parties in the project? And then, of course, because of our interest in 2X, we're looking at are there any women in leadership or executive roles? This is our project life cycle, and it shows you how you start a project all the way through to operation. I'm not going to, again, go into a great deal of detail, but I'm going to tell you that right now with you all, we're in the sourcing phase, of course. We're looking to identify projects that we might want uh, to support. There'll be a pre-screening phase. You're going to hear about our Africa Investment Advisor for this country and how you work with her after this event to um, evaluate whether your project is in fact eligible for DFC support. And assuming that you have reached a point at which you are ready to apply, we go into the application phase. If you'd like to see the application, it's at our website, www.dfc.gov. Then we'll do a due diligence process, which as I said, we're gonna be looking at the impacts of your project. We're gonna be looking at the environmental and social risks and making sure it complies with all of our many requirements for environmental and social standards. We use the IFC performance standards for the most part in that analysis. And then assuming your project is approved, um, it may go through a slightly different process depending on the size. Projects over 50 million go to our board, projects under 50 million just go to our investment committee. Once the project is closed, we negotiate the final loan agreement if it's a loan or sign the insurance contract or presumably sign the equity agreement. And then you will be monitored once your project is operational to make sure that we understand the impacts of your project. So here's an example of Acme Financial, which if it provided us with the information on the screen, they might think they're giving us enough information to evaluate a project with. You know, they're telling us when it was founded, when they got a license, how many customers they serve. They're talking about their impact on women, and they're telling us about how they serve that population and the basic information on the products they, pr they provide. But it really isn't sufficient, and I'm gonna tell you why. This is the crux of the matter here. Um, as a local business, you should be prepared to provide us from the beginning with this kind of information. 
a project summary describing the purpose of the DFC loan, what you intend, or equity, what you intend to use the proceeds for, and you're describing any other debt that your company has, any equity you're contemplating, as well as the tenor of the amount you are seeking and whether you are seeking US dollar or local currency loan. Local currency loans are limited in availability at the moment, but we hope to expand those. We wanna see a market analysis where you've done a study to look at the market, to analyze your competition, to determine where there is supply and demand, and to note how your company is positioned in the workplace. We're gonna look at your project ownership, as I said. We want complete project company ownership information, including charts of subsidiaries and affiliates. You should be listing all primary shareholders, and you should be describing the professional expertise of key personnel. Of course, we're looking for marketing and sales projections. Describe the project economics and the technical parameters. Describe the products or services that you'll provide. Outline the sales and process for the product line. Finally, perhaps, you know, this is the piece where most people aren't quite ready. Uh, and we hope that by doing a presentation such as this, you'll be prepared when you come in to provide these documents. We need financial projections. We need to see your income statements, your balance sheets, your cash flow statements, projections for financial performance over the life of the loan, guarantee, or equity. So now, knowing all of that, you can understand that Acme Financial would be in a much better place to come in and talk to us. They would be able to provide us with the information related to their financing. They're gonna provide us with this information on bankability. They're ready to talk to us about their management capacity. And they're certainly able to talk to us about the financial projections, as well as specifics on what they're seeking funding for. Thank you for listening to the presentation. I now have an opportunity that I think is incredibly valuable, uh, and that is the opportunity to interview one of DFC's clients. So you can truly hear about why they invest with the support of DFC, and they're going to give you some guidance on what the challenges are, as well as the benefits of working with us, along with recommendations. So Gary, if you will go on video, you and I can begin the interview. And the client is Silver Street Capital, and they have done an amazing job of investing across Sub-Saharan Africa. Thank you, Gary, glad to see you. Thanks, Meryl, yeah, no problem, very nice to see you. So I think you're all going to really benefit from this conversation, I did a pre-interview with Gary and just thought the answers were amazing. So can you give us a little bit of background on Silver Street Capital and the Silverlands funds, funds and projects? Uh, sure. Um, so Silver Street Capital is an investment management business based in the United Kingdom with offices in Africa as well. Um, we we uh, set up, up in 2007, so we've been going 14 years now. And um, we're impact investors into the African agricultural sector. Um, and we invest across the entire agricultural sector. Um, so in, in the input side, seed, for example, in farms, um, in processing product coming off a farm um, and, and further downstream, for example, in poultry and, and so on. Um, we manage two funds called Silverlands One and Silverlands Two. Silverlands One is the largest African agriculture fund, and our current total assets are around about $500 million. Um, the countries we've invested in so far um, are sort of Southern and East Africa. So starting at South Africa, and then going eventually up to Uganda and Kenya, but that's sort of Southern uh, going up the Eastern side. So Namibia, Swaziland, Mozambique, Zambia, Tanzania, Uganda, Kenya. Um, and Zambia is our largest, our largest allocation. And then maybe just a little bit about what our goals are. 
um, we, we set a, a goal for our investors, and that's to, to seek attractive returns for investors whilst achieve, achieving a substantial positive social, environmental, and climate impact. So we have a dual goal. We have an impact goal and we have a return goal. And that's very important in everything we do. And our impact goal, as we'll talk a bit later, perhaps is about smallholder farmers looking to help smallholder farmers farm more sustainably and to make more, more money, basically. Um, and then we have the high ESG standards Meryl's been talking about that, that one needs, I think, to, to operate in Africa. Um, and the other thing we're looking to do where we can is, is create a developmental impact. So, for example, we can create a whole new industry in a country. That's really interesting. Um, and so we're looking for those opportunities as well. Gary, what made you choose Zambia as a place to invest? Um, so Zambia was um, one of our very early investments when we when we launched the fund. And uh, we, as I'll talk, we made a number of investments. And there were a number of things about Zambia that did attract us. Um, firstly, um, in terms of doing business, we, we score countries in Africa on seven factors, um, things like ease of doing business, but also corruption, expropriation, risk, political virus risk, and so on. And uh, Zambia does score reasonably well uh, on those scores. It, it also, the, the agricultural sector is clearly well established, a lot of talent at all levels. So, you know, it's, that's what you look, you do want to have the ability to find good people that, and in Zambia really do have top people in the sector and, and be able to, and that allows you to train up other people, um, um, you know, through all, all the way through the different levels in, in the business. Um, the Zambian government has been very encouraging and it's, it doesn't matter which government's in power. It's it's been very positive on the agricultural sector, encouraging foreign investment. Um, you know, we came in the corporate tax rate was higher. They lowered it to ten percent. I mean, that's very interesting. There's no special deal. There's for everyone if you're in the primary production on the primary production side, and it's and and because of that, you've seen this transformation in production in Zambia in the late '90s. You know, maize production in Zambia was around 800,000 tons. Now it's sort of 3 million is fairly normal uh, in Zambia. It's extraordinary. It's now got a surplus. If you look at soya and wheat, as an example, they were tiny in the late 90s. Um, Zambia could become the first country in Africa to be self-sufficient in wheat soon. So probably 300,000 tons needs probably 400. So getting there. So, so there is that enabling environment on the agriculture side, which is which has been good. Um, it's currently obviously it's a difficult um, economic environment at the at the moment, and and but we 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 think that we're going to come out of that. We think quite strongly Zambia will come out. So we're looking kind of through the valley, and we've continued investing right through the pandemic. And this year we we've been investing into our portfolio companies and helping them expand and build because uh, we long term. So we're not seeking short term returns. So we're very positive and continue to be positive on Zambia. Thank you. Um, can you tell us some more about your fascinating projects in Zambia, Silverlands, Zamseed, etc.? Sure. Um, so we've invested close to 120 million US dollars into Zambia so far, of which around 24 million dollars has come through DFC funding. And um, we, we've done um, three main direct uh, portfolio investments and two indirect, but to talk about the, the direct ones first, um, in the Makushi Serenji area, we've invested into two grain farms, one on the sort of eastern edge of Makushi and the other one in Serenji, um, and collectively around 3,000 hectares of irrigated cropping. Um, most of that was developed from scratch, um, so that was a greenfield development led by Colin Huddy, who um, I think most of you probably knows one of the, the, the leaders in the agricultural sector, an outstanding person. Um, and he's done an incredible job um, developing that. And we, we've been, last year, he's, he's put up a silo complex. As I said, we were investing throughout and working with smallholder farmers, training, and so on. And then in, in the south, in, near Zimba, 
which is, um, as you know, 70 kilometers from Livingston. Um, we bought a ranch um, a number of years ago, and there we've done a project which is um, on the beef side related to the surrounding smallholder farmers, uh, supporting about 8,000 farmers now, um, both on the cropping and on the beef side. Um, we introduced dipping for the farmers, etc., uh, to remove a lot of the issues that were in the area on uh, tick-borne diseases. So the mort cattle mortality rates really dropped there because of that. Um, and we also been developing tree crops on that farm. We like the, that environment where it's quite dry. So so long as you have water, it's an interesting environment. Great, interesting products. And we built a dam back in 2013, which Colin oversaw it, um, the 13 million cube dam and, and uh, been able to irrigate from there. Um, and then the third one was Zam seed. Many of you may know, so um, a, a real Zambian uh, leader in our view. Um, and we, we've invested in Zam seed. We continue to back them. We've been backing the expansion throughout last year and this year we're injecting more capital. And Zam seed is, um, it's a Zambian seed company been around since 1980 effectively, um, but we think has really good germplasm. So the seed product and it's specifically aimed at smallholder farmers. So um, that's been good. And then indirectly, we, we are shareholders in uh, Quanta Foods, which um, many of you may know the Blacoma feed and uh, the Mega Eggs brands. Uh, that's They have a, a Zambian subsidiary, so we're on the poultry side. And then Crooks Brothers, which has a, a small a sugarcane farm in Mazabuka that some of you uh, may be aware of. Um, and so far, you know, through that, we've created 850 jobs so far. Uh, businesses are still growing. You talked about your smallholder farmers, and I know from our conversation, I was pleased to see how many of the women receiving your services and or how many of the farmers receiving your services and training were women. Can you talk about the role of women owned smallholder farms? Sure. Um, well, it's, it's, I mean, it's, as you, I'm sure you know, about two thirds of, um, well, something around 60% to two thirds of the population in Zambia live on smallholder farms. Um, and uh, most of those farms are actually managed by women. So it's, it's around, most people would estimate 65 to 70% of those farms are run by women. So often the husband is, you know, on, on a mine or working at a factory in town and so on. And so the farms are run by women. And that group is often the poorest, you know, in most countries in Africa, the poorest and lowest income group. And therefore interesting from a developmental perspective, because if one can help that group raise their incomes, then you, you can have a very broad, almost grassroots level impact. Um, and um, and the fact that two thirds of women is also interesting. And what we found on the poultry side um, is a higher percentage. It's more like uh, seventy to eighty percent tend to be women on the smallholder poultry side. Um, so, what, what when we look at the smallholder farmers, the the yields they're earning on um, on their crops tend to be much lower than potential. So, typically in Zambia, the smallholder farmer these days is is getting sort of two two and a half tons a hectare. As in some areas, three tons. Now in Africa, that's actually a good result. That's one of the, the best. The African average would be below two tons a hectare. However, if you, you go down the road to one of the commercial farms, you'll be seeing farmers regularly getting nine or 10 tons a hectare. Now, the global average for maize is six tons. So the question is, can we help those farmers raise their yields from two tons to four tons, let's say. And how does one do it? What are the issues? Why are the yields lower and so on? We know one of the things we like about Zambia is the climate's great, particularly the northern half, obviously the rains are reliable, it's good climate. Um, and the, 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 key, the key issues those farmers face is, is firstly on the input side, um, getting the right inputs on time and, and particularly seed. Um, so a number of farmers are still using farm safe seed and it's important to convert to hybrid seed, but also the other inputs and then and something like lime is very important, um, you know, for putting aside fertilizer, etc. And then secondly, the techniques on, on farm are quite often suboptimal. 
and applying a conservation farming technique uh, can raise yields. It's usually half to half a ton to a ton. The the right seed will add a ton. So just those two things, technique and seed, you can double double yields. And then finally, can you provide a market for a higher value crop? And we've seen some great initiatives in Zambia, not by us, by other people, but introducing soybeans. And we saw a tremendous step up in soybean production around 2015, 16. And that's really nice in rotation with the maize. So now you have a more sustainable approach and you apply these conservation farming techniques, which were developed in the US in the 1930s in the Dust Bowl era, mulching, composting, and so on. And you can dub basically double yields. So for us, that target group is really interesting because firstly, you're raising incomes in the poorest group. Secondly, you, you, it's, it's, you're making the, it more sustainable. So you're reducing deforestation because people are not monocropping, they're farming better with the right mulch and so on. Thirdly, you're having, um, so there's a climate benefit. And then thirdly, it's disproportionately benefiting women. So that's, um, that's how we look at it and, and why we are really interested in that. In that, in that impact. We're objective. certainly happy at JFC to have had the chance to partner with you. Can you tell me a little bit about why, <clears throat> pardon me, why you chose to work with JFC in supporting your projects? Sure. Um, it, it was interesting because we, when we started out, we, um, you know, we, we hadn't heard of DFC and then we met with Cambridge Associates who were advising DFC and they suggested, you know, heard us present. So actually, this, this fits well. So we approached DFC and there was a there was a call for proposals at the time for um, uh, sustainable investment in natural resources. It wasn't Africa and it wasn't agriculture specifically. Um, and but we, we had a look into it and we felt there were a number of interesting things about DFC. Um, the one was the long term nature uh, of the organization. They really are looking at long term sustainable uh, development. Um, they also um, we're, we were looking um, and investing into the agricultural sector. And one of the things we were concerned about was working capital funding. I know many of you in Zambia right now, that's a serious issue. And the banks, you know, are very short of dollars and it's difficult just to roll overdrafts. And, and that's true in other countries, not just Zambia. Um, but we wanted to de-risk that. So can we, you know, at least have some backup or some support which would allow us just to um, be a bit stronger through the tough times. And by having that funding and the terms of which were well suited, it, 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 often it's not just the interest rate, it's what are the terms like? Is it going to put a gun in our head at a certain point in time in the future where we have to? But no, they were actually really um, good terms um, for us. So, so we, we, we felt that DFC was a very good partner and um, we, we, we also, um, on the political risk side, I know you mentioned political risk insurance. I, 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 I can't tell you how important that is for fundraising. So particularly for us, we, 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 our money we've been raising from non-traditional investors in Africa. So European pension funds, US pension funds, foundations, endowments, these institutional investors. For them, it's, it's almost the first question they're going to ask you is about political risk and to have to be able to say the US government has provided political risk insurance if an asset is expropriated um, if we can't get our, our money into dollars or out of the country they will step in if there's some sort of war and riot risk um, and our investors get 90 percent of the capital back of the insured value back it just draws a line under that risk and um, and uh, it, it proved to be you know, extremely important. So um, we've, and DFC offers very attractive uh, premiums. Um, and uh, we actually have insurance with both the World Bank and DFC, and both are really good. The other advantage, I'll just, just quickly on that, is, you know, with, with DFC, obviously it's the US government. The US government um, is there. If we ever have any issues, so if, if for example, We've never we've not had any issues so in any of our investments anyway. But if, for example, a, an expropriation process starts in in let's call it Mozambique or, or, or Uganda, then 
um, the US government will mediate, advocate on our, our, our behalf um, and intervene because of the insurance. And that's so powerful because the US government has a bilateral agreement with every country it's providing all the, the great financial, financial support. Meryl's talking about infrastructure, you know, roads, power, renewable energy, et cetera, and healthcare. Um, and this, the insurance comes under that bilateral agreement. So it's, it's really powerful. So, yeah, so that's, that was why, and we found DFC to be very good to work with, um, very patient, long-term supportive. Um, so, you know, I would recommend them, um, to you. Thank you, Gary. Those are, you raised two points that I always think of maybe missed in conversations about DFC. The fact that we are patient capital, that you can rely on us not to pull the rug out from under you, but try to make things work. Uh, and the fact that our political risk cover gives you that advantage of having a US government participant in the project and all that that does to perhaps deter actions against a project unfairly. Um, so you've talked about the benefits of DFC and we wanna be fair. Uh, would you tell us a little bit about the challenges of working with DFC? Um, sure. Um, I mean, we, we, we have had some investment from other development financial institutions, CDC, IFU, um, the, the Danes, uh, and FinFund, the Fins, CDC's UK. Um, and what, what, what you'll find in, 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 in any government fund is what, what you would expect an investor. They're going to... They need to, as, as Meryl was saying, need to know exactly who your partners are, as an example. Um, and and uh, the detail is important because of um, their, their reputational risk and the need to align with their own policies. So it, it, it's important when, when working with DFC to, to, to um, be transparent and, 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 and clear in your documentation. Make sure you um, you, you, you're showing everything and, uh, don't be worried about anything. Just, you know, disclose everything. Um, but you, you are going to have to go through, um, you know, let's call it more detailed scrutiny than for an, uh, let's call it a commercial investor pension fund. And, and once invested, um, um, the ESG standards, Meryl was talking about essentially IFC performance standards. Um, you need to comply with those, um, and you need to demonstrate that. And, and again, uh, you know, one should be transparent, but, and, and it's not a box ticking thing. One needs to implement it. So we have an annual ESG audit, uh, done independently on all of our Zambian companies. Yes. And, uh, DFC get a copy of that. And as if they're each 50 pages long, lots of detail. And of course, we've got to know the ESG team at DFC very well, and they come and visit, um, pre-COVID, it would be every year. So they'll come around, see the portfolio companies, um, and they're ESG specialists. They'll spend two, three days on the farm in Zimba, for example, and speak to staff, to the communities we're working with, et cetera, and have a look at the projects, the expansions. And what we found is, so, so you need to be able to commit that time. And, and, but what we found is that their expertise is very useful for us. So we, we we're learning from them um, in how to deal with multiple issues. It's a silly example, but you know, plastic containers that held chemicals that um, we were worried that when you dispose of them, that you know, somebody would use them to hold water and there's residual. How do we get rid of them? We punctured them and then but how do you, but it's plastic, they don't um, you know, they don't uh, degrade and so on. And in the end, in you know, so we were asking DFC, have you seen this in other of your investments? So we came up with a solution to to great to chop it up a, a, a machine but that, that's just an example but it, and the 2x challenge um on the gender side at the moment we're working with dfc on that because to be honest it's not something we're experts on we um you know exactly how do we work towards that challenge what's the best way to do that and we we we're working on the smaller side as i said it's vast majority are women but on our boards we've got hardly any women across our uh, our 11 investments and a lot of a lot of time we're bogged down in the developments and we need to step back and and so we we're actively looking in zambia at the moment uh for women board members um and uh and, and in namibia and in tanzania for example but um 
so I think you know in the experience of what I would say is um, you know there, there's quite a bit of work at the beginning there's a lot of legal work um, detailed documentation um, post investment uh, is excellent to work with there is a, a requirement so you need to resource up on the ESG side um, you know, make sure people are responsible for it and reporting on it uh, but um, you know I, I think it's 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 without doubt it's been a good experience. Thank you, Gary. So just one last question. Do you have any other recommendations for the local businesses that are on this call that are new to investing in this way? Um, yeah, my, my my first recommendation is um, you know, you know, uh, don't panic. <laughs> so you, you'll get a bunch of documents to fill in and you're going to have to provide lots of stuff. Just take your time, be patient. It's worth it because DFC's interest rates are highly competitive. They're long-term patient, good investors, and you can learn from them as well. Um, but don't panic, seek advice. Um, and uh, if any of you would, would like to have input and, and just like to hear you know, a bit more from us, obviously very welcome um, to contact us. Um, um, but I think that, that just make sure on the ESG side, you, you, you in advance, think about that resourcing. Um, you're going to need to comply with IFC performance standards. So it affects everything. It's health and safety, your employment, everybody's going to have contracts, um, how you manage or store your chemicals or, or, or everything like that. And just, um, it, it, you know, it could be as silly as, you know, where's the fire, fire extinguisher in the office? Um, if there's, if you know, when you do your ESG review, if it's missing, okay, it just becomes an action point, and next time you're going to check that again. But you have to have that pro this kind of thinking. It's like a project management, and I want to complete tasks, so I want to tick all these boxes. Um, but I, I, I would recommend looking seriously because, especially if your projects are long term and, and you want a stable long term backer, um, I think it's worth um, persisting. Uh, it'll be tougher than. I, th I think uh, maybe in, in Zambia, but it normally through a normal banking process, it's tougher. Zambia, it's a nightmare, but, <laughs> but uh, at the moment. Um, but and then on the political risk insurance, I would consider it. Um, if you're looking especially to raise third party outside of Zambia, um, I think it just it helps. Um, it helps you in the fundraising. Thank you so much, Gary. We're so grateful that you were able to speak to us today. Silver Street Capital, the Silverlands Projects, uh, ZAMSE, these are all things we are honored to be a part of. And we look forward to continuing working with your company and its amazing projects in the future. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Mayor. Thank you. We are going to turn now to Q&A. And so I'm going to ask all of you to put your questions into the question and answer panel at the bottoms of your screen, which you can find by touching those three little dots on the bottom right. Or if you can't find that, please put your questions into chat. And uh, I'm going to ask Andrew Yavinsky if he's available to keep track of questions coming in and uh, reading those questions to me. We're just going to give you a minute to, to input your questions. And while we do that, I'm going to say that um, I will be um, introducing some of our team so that you have a chance to know who will be answering some of the questions. I'm going to do the formal introductions um, after Q&A so that we can get right to it. Um, let me see if I have any questions yet. Yeah, we have one question. Thank you, Andrew. If you could keep uh, announce the questions, that would be great. Yeah. The first one is, um, how long does it normally take for you to review project proposals and provide feedback to applicants? I'm asking this because some of the activities we are engaged in are sometimes very sensitive and be important to have feedback in a timely manner in order to facilitate a more efficient execution of project activities. Uh, you know, I'm going to turn this over to Dia Martin, who is in our Office of Development Credit, if she's available. 
we have several different departments. We have the investment funds department. We have the office of development credit that handles projects smaller than 50 million. And then we have our SFI group that handles projects over 50 million. Uh, Dia, are you available to answer that question? I see you yes. are. Uh -huh. I'm here. Can you hear me well? Okay, perfect. So thank you for that question. I, I think it's a really good question. And the answer will be a very helpful, it varies. Uh, I think what we see is that um, a typical project, I would say it could take anywhere from six to eight months from start to finish, but there are a lot of different variables. So one of the things that we would first want to, to understand is the nature of the project, the size of it. The size of the project would determine what approval process that you would have to go through as well as the readiness of the client. So sometimes we get projects, they're, I guess, relatively um, smaller in size. So it's a very straightforward approval process and a client is ready to go. And, and for those deals, I've seen really fast approval um, timeline of, of less than three months, but we also have projects on the other end where there's a lot of back and forth we obviously as a DFI um, view ourselves as developmental. So we'll work with the client very much to prepare themselves and, and help them get ready for financing. And the deals could also be larger in size. So it could take a bit, a bit longer. It could take up to a year or so, or even um, sometimes a little bit longer. But on average, I say six to eight months. And then I'll just end and, and talk a little bit about our approval process. I, I lead the Portfolio for Impact and Innovation Program. And every time I speak, I always want to talk about this program. This is a program for earlier stage companies and funds that have a very high social impact. And this program, we can provide financing of up to 10 million. And we have a streamlined approval process that goes through our department. So it's a, it's a little bit faster. If a deal is over 20 million, it would actually have to go to a formal credit committee as well as an investment committee. So there's a little bit of time added on to, to go through both of those committees for approval. And then the last point is if a deal is over 50 million, it has to go to our board for approval. So you obviously wanna factor in that additional time for, for the project to go to board. And I hope that answers the question. Merrill, if there's anything else, um, just let me know. That's great. Thank you, Dia. I want to give Suzanne Echevre an opportunity to talk a little bit about the investment funds process as well. Are you available to do that, Suzanne? Yes, I am. I'm having really bad internet problems this morning. I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. I can hear you just fine. Thank you. But we're getting a full view of your kitchen. Yeah, <laughs> great. You can see my my very neat kitchen. Um, let me um actually turn off my video because I think it'll be better for me internet wise. Okay, sorry guys. So yeah, so I'm happy to be here. Thank you for um the opportunity to uh talk about our investment funds process, and um, you know we have been working very closely with Silver Street, so it's nice to see you. Um, uh, it's nice to see you again, Gary. We, um, so in our process, we accept uh, applications from investment funds through an open portal. And we're looking for uh, funds that, uh, fund managers uh, that have a, you know, a developmental impact um, that are uh, investing in uh, sectors that are, uh, you know, priority sectors for us. We have, um, certain uh, priorities in Africa, certainly in agriculture, as we know, uh, in infrastructure and, uh, you know, uh, venture, certain venture capital type of projects um, that we're looking at in Asia. So we have a number of priorities. We're very, uh, very focused on Africa. We have a portfolio there um, that we're still trying to, you know, to develop. Um, we uh, like the agricultural sector. We have some exposure in, in Southern Africa, um, really uh, excluding mainly the high income, higher, um, higher income countries like South Africa, really focusing more on 
countries like Zambia and, and um, other countries uh, in that region. Uh, so the process is uh, applying through our portal. We take an evaluation approach where we gather all the uh, applications kind of on a monthly basis. We have teams internally that look at sort of geographically um, focused. So we'll have an Africa team that will look at the proposals on a monthly basis. We'll review the proposals um, for strategy, for um, quality of fund manager, for experience, track record. And if we find that the strategy is, is meets our, you know, our developmental mandate and our commercial um, focus, we will uh, take that to the next level. We'll screen it. We'll take it to our screening committee. It's acceptable. Then we'll start a really more intense due diligence process. At which point um, we would typically go into the region maybe for a week or so to do due diligence. Obviously for the last year we have been doing due diligence remotely, which has actually worked pretty well. And uh, once we are um, finalized that process, we'll take the project back, the proposal back to our evaluation committee. And uh, if, that is ex if that is accepted, then we'll prepare it for investment committee and board. Uh, so that is, the, that is generally the process um, for working with our investment funds group. Now, of course, we uh, now have equity authority, so we're looking to deploy um, equity this year into, our, uh, into these private equity funds. And this will be our second year of deploying equity. And we're looking forward to uh, getting, uh, receiving, continuing to receive a number of uh, really good proposed equity program. We still can provide debt uh, to funds as we have in the past. Typically that will be probably targeted towards more infrastructure type funds and, you know, those sort of structures that are more amenable to debt, but in particular, we really are focusing on deploying equity um, to these, these very um, promising fund managers in the region. Thank you, Suzanne. Andrew, do we have another question? Yes, the next one is, uh, does DFC give financial support to startup businesses? Um, we actually need you to be an operating entity with some equity invested and some track record for us to be able to work with you. Uh, we're not a venture capital firm. Um, but perhaps what might be interesting right now is to call on David Hester, who can talk a little bit about our technical development program uh, and let you know what we might be able to do to help you become ready for an investment. David? Meryl, thanks very much. Hello, everyone. Um, our technical development program provides feasibility study and technical assistance funding that prepares deals for DFC debt finance, equity investment, or political risk insurance. So in the case of smaller and newer businesses, if there is a business that is interested in obtaining a loan from DFC or interested in obtaining equity investment from DFC, but there is a need for the business to do a little bit additional work to be ready for investment or to receive a loan. You know, for example, if in order to be suitable as a loan recipient or equity investee, the, the, the small company needs to improve its IT system. We can provide technical assistance or feasibility study funding to help that small company, for example, improve its IT system or do other things it needs to do in order to be ready to receive a DFC loan or equity investment or political risk insurance. Um, so in the case of newer and smaller companies, that's a way our technical development program can help and can help make the company ready to work with the other parts of DFC. Thanks so much, David. Do I have another question, Andrew? Yes. Um, the previous iteration of DFC in reference to OPIC had a minimum required component of U.S. content before investment. Does that still hold true? And if so, what is it? DFC is not required to have a U.S. partner or a U.S. nexus in the deal in order to fund a project. Uh, unlike OPIC, which did have to have by requirement, by legal requirement, a U.S. nexus for the project. We never actually required local U.S. content in the project. In fact, we're prohibited from requiring U.S. goods um, for a project. They can be there. We certainly encourage it, but we can't require it. 
Uh, but most importantly, going forward, it's important for you to know that this is why we're here today, that we want to work with local companies and they do not have to have a U.S. partner in order for us to work with them. Any other questions, Andrew? Yep. Um, so we have two from the same person. The main barrier for investment has been the reluctance to invest in greenfield projects. How successful has DS DFC been in this type of investment category? And then it's followed up with, if we look at Silver Street, it looks like a possible proxy investor on behalf of organizations like DFC. Would you have other funds that look, look at other sectors apart from agriculture? We do have other investment funds and I'm gonna turn back to Suzanne to talk about those. Suzanne, are you available to respond to that question? She may be having some audio trouble. So uh, let me say that our investment funds are an important vehicle for us being able to reach small and medium enterprises and new investors, uh, investors that are introducing new technologies that maybe aren't ready for a debt investment but are ready for an equity investment. New projects obviously have an opportunity to create returns over a, a longer period. Um, those returns can be exciting to investment funds, uh, even when those entities are not yet ready to receive debt. And we have investment funds that we support in all sectors that we are um, working in, everything from health to climate-related projects, renewable energy, food related projects, you name it. So there are a large number of investment funds that we support in all different sectors. I also want to point out because I saw someone asked about smaller projects under a million, uh, that DFC not only lends to projects directly, but as I mentioned, to financial institutions. When we lend to a local bank or a US bank or a European bank that's operating in a sub-Saharan African country, the goal is then for those business, those banks to on lend often to SMEs um, in order to help build up the debt opportunities for small and medium enterprises in countries where they would not otherwise be available. And in many cases, we make that uh, financial support to banks uh, contingent upon some portion of loans going to women or underrepresented populations. I believe Suzanne might be back and available. Suzanne, did you want to address the question about other investment funds we support? Yeah, I apologize. I had um, a lapse in internet there. And so I, I came in and you were talking about investment funds, Meryl, so I figured I missed my missed a question. So could you, uh, could you repeat what the discussion was? Sure. Uh, one of our uh, questions was about You've talked about, you know, the Silver Street Capital. Are do you have investment funds that you support in other sectors? If you want to address, you know, the breadth of the investment funds we support. Oh sure. Um, so we uh, support um, investment funds in a wide range of sectors and geographies uh, in our portfolio. Um, you know, up until I said uh, last year, we were primarily debt. And through our debt uh, instrument, we were we we have we've developed we've built a portfolio of um, investments in technology, in agriculture, in uh, you know gro any type of growth equity, real estate, um, early stage funds, impact funds. We have uh, we have a number of early stage, um, early investment funds, high impact. Uh, in Asia, primarily in Southeast Asia. And so, you know, really we look to um, the strategy, to be, uh, a developmental strategy. And of course, a lot of these sectors, you know, have that sort of imp impact, that developmental impact. So we look to, we look to a wide range of sectors. As every other line at DFC, we look, you know, for environmental, uh, environmentally safe projects, projects that don't have uh, worker rights issues, and projects that are don't have U.S. effects issues. So we have a number of policy issues that 
you know, these statutory clearance processes that make sure that our, our projects are safe and developmentally impactful. Um, as we move to the equity uh, program and we're able to deploy more equity, we are all, you know, we're continuing the same strategy as I just, uh, you know, same sector focuses, but we're also looking at more early stage funds. So we have a number of early stage uh, venture capital uh, series A, Series B type um, fund managers that, that we're looking at. So typically these are mostly we found are, are in, um, in, in Asia and mainly tech focused, uh, you know, health tech, fintech and, and other technologies, digital technology. So we're really looking to deploy a certain amount of capital to help build this, um, you know, this sort of uh, or an ecosystem out in, in a region that is really uh, sort of favorable to that in South, in Asia. So Thank we, you. You know, we have a wide range of sectors that we can support. Thank you, Suzanne. Andrew, do I have any other questions? Uh, do you provide concessional loans with low interest rates and what grace period do you offer before repayments start to allow for construction to be completed? So that repayments are based on revenue generated by the project. What are indicative interest rates charge? Dia, would you be able to pick up this question, please? Sure, happy to take the question. So yes, we look at each project on an individual basis and look at the merits for that project. And, and as you correctly identified, we would look at a sculpted repayment structure based on the financials for the project. So if it is a construction project that would take perhaps a year or two to build um, before you're able to, to get the revenues or the cash flows to repay the loan, we can look at a one to two year repayment. I mean, I mean, sorry, one to two year grace period on the principal being repaid. So yes, that's something we look at on every project on an individual basis based on the finances, financials of that project. And then I would say we offer competitive market rates. And again, that's really based on the project, that's based on the other investors involved. And also we look at developmental impact as, as we look at pricing. So I think we uh, refer to our pricing as competitive. And where we really have an advantage is, as was mentioned earlier uh, by Gary, is that we offer um, longer tenors. So we have very patient capital. So we see that we're very additional in many markets. Um, you may only be able to get two, three year funding, but we have the ability to provide funding for five, seven, even 10 years, depending upon what the, the nuances are of the project. So I hope that answers the question and, and Meryl, happy to elaborate on any points. Thank you, Dia, that was great. Andrew, do I have any more questions? There was one that was asking about um, the specific sectors that DFC supports, and I think that we probably touched on that unless you had anything else to add. Yeah, I just uh, would say that while we have obviously got these priority sectors, health, energy, IT and communications, WASH, uh, financial inclusion, we're open to almost any sector that makes sense financially, is commercially viable in the market with the exception, as I said, of prohibited sectors, which include tobacco, gambling, any activity that's illegal in the country. Please do let us know what your interest is. Um, we're going to talk in a minute about how to follow up with your projects uh, and we'll pursue a conversation about your sector. Was no, that the have, Andrew or was there? We have a couple more. Um, okay. The next one is, in reference to your comment to lending uh, to banks, what we have found in, in Zambia is that the banks load the interest rates that are similar to commercial lending. Is there any way of regulating the owned, the onward lending rates so that access to finance is more impact driven and at affordable rates? Well, obviously we don't dictate the rates at a commercial bank. But if we are lending to a commercial bank or guaranteeing loans at a commercial bank, we can choose not to work with a bank that appears to have excessive uh, interest rates or unreasonable terms. When we're evaluating a bank that we choose to work with, 
uh, we're careful to understand what will be the terms of the loans that they then offer to their borrowers. And the next one is, how do you evaluate project viability from a technical or scientific perspective when the project is highly specialized and innovative and renewable energy sources not, not seen elsewhere in Southern Africa? Sharing technical data with third party specialists may impact future competitiveness. Um, we're always very careful about business confidentiality. We understand in working with local businesses that we have a mandate to keep their technical information uh, confidential. But David Hester, do you want to address the other part of this conversation, which might be how we evaluate technologies? Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you, Meryl. Um, so we're very focused on um, renewable energy in particular, as I, I know was discussed already today. In the area of feasibility, technical assistance, we're committed to spending at least $50 million over the next five years uh, in order to develop climate projects that promote um, a better climate. And of course, renewable energy is a very important part of that. In terms of technology, if it's technology that is commercially deployed in the world in countries other in Zambia, the fact that it hasn't been deployed commercially in Zambia, I think, isn't a, necessarily an issue for us in terms of funding a feasibility study or technical assistance. Um, and going back to what Merrill was saying about confidentiality, when we hire engineers to guide us on a feasibility study or technical assistance, they are governed by confidentiality rules as well. And so any technical information we share with them, they are um, prevented from disclosing. Um, so in a nutshell, um, that's how it impacts the feasibility study and technical assistance area. We are looking for new and innovative types of projects and are always happy to talk with sponsors about the specific technology they're using. Thank you, David. Nafisa, I'm wondering if you might want to add something here about our Global Health and Prosperity Initiative and how we evaluate technologies related to the health sector. Are you available, Nafisa? Hi, Meryl, can you, if you can you hear me? Thank you. Perfect. Hi, everyone. Lovely to meet you, and thank you so much for the opportunity. You know, it's been an incredible year. We launched our Health and Prosperity Initiative May of last year to increase the footprint across the DFC in the healthcare space. And I think what's been really incredible is finding innovative solutions to really deal with today's problems. And we definitely are seeing that in the med tech space for sure. I think in terms of evaluating, you know, how we look at these projects, we still, you know, require a, a, a strong ENSD due diligence, and that will, you know, continue to be the case for all of our healthcare projects. And I think that's the case for most DFIs as they're looking at, a, at an industry that is inherently more risky. But what I would say is, you know, at least in terms of, um, you know, how we would maybe assess the risk of, of these projects, I would love for, for, you know, potential clients to come forward and whether it's something that we can maybe provide financing for, or maybe it's an opportunity to work with the interagency across the United States government. We'd love to be able to make those connections where possible. A lot of instances we see incredible technologies where you're maybe just too early stage for DFC, but it's an opportunity maybe for USAID or other entities to be able to engage and then maybe help, um, you know, get you to a stage where DFC would be um, much more, uh, you know, appealing for, for financing, whether it's debt or equity. Thank you. That was really helpful, Nafisa. Uh, Andrew, do we have any more questions? Yes, I just had a few more come in. Um, the first one is asking about can we fund uh, educational technology firms? Yes, we can. We do projects in education. We do projects in housing, health. You know, we're active in a number of what we would call the social sectors. And then the next one is, what are the typical interest rates DFC would apply on financing? And then the same person asked, is there any contribution requirement from the promoter? And what are the typical repayment periods? I think Dia actually addressed that previously. And so I, I don't want to go into a long explanation of it, except to say again that we provide commercial rates. The rates that are provided will depend upon the term and tenor of the loan, the needs of the projects. Um, you know, often it's you know treasury US Treasury plus two to four percent, but it really depends on the project the tenor of the loan will depend upon the needs of the project. 
uh, where a major infrastructure project might get a 20 year tenor, you know, a small, you know, retail operation may only need a three to five year tenor. Uh, did I miss, I think there was one more aspect to that question, Andrew. What was the rest of it? Um, there was, is, is there any contribution requirement from the promoter? Uh, yes. Yep. Yes. Yes, but obviously there has to be an equity investment by the sponsor uh, or other investors. We don't full, you know, fund 100% of any project. Any other questions, Andrew? Um, that is all I have for right now. Okay. Well, we're going to move close out our Q&A session. Um, I will let you know that uh, all the participants in this event will receive a follow-up email from us. And that will include the presentation itself and information on who to contact in order for us to reach out to you and, and do some meetings. And this is an excellent time for me to switch over to our introduction of key US government officials. Um, when we do these events, we do not do them alone. We do them with the support of the embassy, with the support of USAID, with the support of Prosper Africa, and most importantly, the support of the person you're going to meet next, which is our Africa investment advisor in the country in which we are operating. Uh, and so I first want to introduce Diana Juguna, who's our AIA, our Africa investment advisor for Southern Africa. And she's gonna to talk to you quite a bit um, about what her role is, how she operates and how you can work with her. Diana. Thanks a lot, Meryl. Hi, everyone. My name is Diana Njuguna. I'm the Africa Investment Advisor to the DFC, responsible for Southern Africa. That's about 10 countries, and Zambia is just one of them. My main role is to do pre-screening of any opportunities that you bring to our table. So to the extent you email me with a project, I will go through it to see if it meets our criteria, and I will send you a list of questions which will help me better evaluate it and see if we can put together a deal recommendation memo. Um, so to the extent I have all the sufficient information, I would probably have a call with you just to get a better sense of the opportunity. And again, help me draft that deal recommendation memo. Um, I'm also available to answer any questions that you might have, uh, clarify anything that was not clear. Please do not hesitate to reach out to me. I am available and I'm here to assist. Um, in terms of the next steps, uh, I mean, over the next couple of weeks, I'd be happy to uh, exchange emails or arrange calls with any of you who may have opportunities which might meet our criteria. To the extent you need some time, it's okay. There is no rush. You can send them as and when the information is available. Um, you know, as Meryl mentioned, we, we require certain uh, pieces of information to assist us to evaluate opportunities. So if you need time to prepare that, please, by all means, feel free to do that. Um, I look forward to interacting with you all and seeing how we can potentially close a number of deals in Zambia. Thank you. Sorry, you're mute. Sorry about that. Uh, as I mentioned, we're going to be putting up key contact information for key individuals at the end of the session. Uh, so you can email people that you need to contact. Diana will be your first point of contact and your most important one as a local business looking to determine if you can use DFC for your financial support. Uh, and so we're very grateful to have Diana here. She was you know, instrumental in helping us to organize this, but most importantly, she will be the person that you follow up with to bring your projects to DFC's attention. Uh, the next person I want to just quickly introduce is Adam Norakane, who uh, has been very helpful to us in organizing the event. Um, Adam, if you want to go on video for just a second, and, and if you have anything you want to say, that would be great. Hi. Hello, everyone. My name is Adam Norakani. I'm with USAID Zambia. I'm the director of the Economic Development Office. Uh, very excited that we had this opportunity to, for some of you, introduce DFC, and for others, just have a little refresher. Uh, many of you are familiar with what they do. 
uh, but just to say that uh, my colleague David Mpundu and I are the DFC points of contacts, the focal points at the USAID mission here in Zambia. So uh, please feel free to reach out to us and uh, we'll be looking for ways to, to help you work through this process. Thanks. Thank you. And I know that the next two gentlemen didn't necessarily need to speak at their request, but uh, I did want to introduce Joseph Snap and John Gray, who are with the US Embassy's economic section and who were also incredibly helpful in putting together this event. And David Mapundu, who Adam just mentioned, is working with us, worked with us on this uh, from the US aid perspective. Finally, I want to just quickly reintroduce some of the people you met from DFC uh, in our previous session. Dia Martin, who again is with our Office of Development Credit, works on projects under 50 million. Suzanne Achevery, who is with our Investment Funds Group. David Hester, who is our Technical Development Manager. Nafisa Jawani, who is handling all of our health projects. And then I'm not sure if she is still on, perhaps not. Uh, I did wanna just note that Elizabeth Boggs Davidson has joined our staff recently as the VP of our Office of Development Policy. Uh, and she's an important uh, individual in terms of looking at our evaluations of environmental and social guidelines. So with that, I'm going to see if I can share. There you go. There you go. So here is our contact list for Zambia. Um, you will, as I said, receive the presentation in, uh, as an attachment to an email, so you'll have this on hand. Uh, but I really wanted to emphasize that Diana Jaguna is your first um, point of contact uh, in determining if you want to proceed with us on projects that uh, are of interest. Diana is available you know, for the long haul here. We may turn off this um, screen in a little bit but Diana will still be there and able to work with you, as she said, on projects, whether you're ready to talk to us now or six months from now. Uh, and you can see that we have the contact information on there also for Adam Narakani, John Gray, Joseph Snap, and David Mopundo. So just want to close us out by saying thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are so looking forward to expanding our operations and business potential in Zambia. All of you are the individuals who will make that happen. Our private sector partners who work on projects that are uh, so valuable in terms of economic and social development. But of course, above all, we want you to have commercially viable, profitable, successful operations. And we hope that by working with us, you can get there. So thank you again. And uh, we appreciate you having attended the event.